Hello viewers, you join me somewhere on the Adriatic, bobbing up and down on a paddleboard. I've just been paddleboarding out here. It's very peaceful. The water is a little bit cold this time of year in May. In fact, I checked and it's 63 degrees and they reckon that 70 degrees Fahrenheit is the optimal temperature for swimming in the sea or well, you don't really want to swim in sea that's colder than that um, but it's quite pleasant I'm just having a rest here and um, the reason why I'm here really obviously I like paddle boarding but the reason for being here on the coast and for paddle boarding on this particular day is because I need some peace to gather my thoughts because it's actually 20 years today that my mother died and I thought that would be worth documenting in a video because she was a very special woman she impacted my life profoundly and people like her deserve to be remembered and if you're not going to remember someone on the 20th anniversary of their death when are you going to remember them so here I am and what can I say we had an interesting uh, experience or we had a, a fun day out actually yesterday we went as a family to split where I am now or where we are staying is not far from Brella in fact if you look in the distance that's sort of Brella there and the mountain above is Biokovo uh, which is the second highest mountain in Croatia and we're about 40 to 50 minutes away from Split so we went there yesterday as a family had a nice afternoon wandering around Split one of our favorite places to go and we decided to go to the cinema and this was a big deal obviously because probably many of you watching haven't managed to go back to the cinema yet since this pandemic began but this was our first time back I didn't even know we could do it, but apparently we could, so we went and had coke and popcorn and everything. It's fantastic. And we watched Raya and the Last Dragon, latest Disney flick, which I can highly, highly recommend. Really lovely film. Fun for adults as well. Most of the Disney films are, aren't they? Packed with jokes that grown-ups can chuckle at. And I don't want to spoil the film because I want you all to go and watch it and enjoy it. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because, again, without, without wanting to spoil it too much, there is a scene towards the end which has to do with the resurrection. When you see the film, you'll know what I mean. It has to do with resurrection. The dead coming back to life you know and that's when it boom <laughs> that's when it got me you know this is what I was waiting for this was what I was expecting because my mother died when I was 21 in 2001 she died of breast cancer The days before her death were very upsetting and distressing because she became increasingly confused. She didn't know what day it was. She was asking for strange things. She once asked for a glass of water and she was saying, can I have a glass of... Um, and we were all egging her on to say water and what came out was, can I have a glass of socks she saw some socks and that was the word that she thought meant water that's how confused she was <sighs> towards the end and one of the most painful 
things about saying goodbye was that we couldn't. We never got the opportunity to say goodbye. Because her mind went. By the time it was time to say goodbye, she literally didn't have the mental capability of saying goodbye. There was, I think, the day before her death, maybe it was even the day, I, I think it was the day before, because the day of her death she was really, really bad. But maybe the day before she died, um, we were in her room and um, she went to enormous effort, because she was very, very ill. She went, went to enormous effort to sit on the edge of her bed, sit upright like I'm sitting now on this paddle board. And myself, my sister, my dad were all in the room watching, thinking, what's she doing? And I can't remember whether it was me or my sister, just went and stood in front of her and she stood up and gave the biggest hug. The biggest hug you can imagine. One for me, one for my sister. It's almost as though in her besieged mind that was the only way she could think of to say goodbye. <laughs> I was really trying not to cry. Um, and that must have been a real fight for her to do that, but she did it. And it would have been hours before she uh, finally passed away. Uh, but how cruel is that? How cruel? I mean, obviously, I, I no longer believe there is a God. But to create intelligent beings and give them a finite amount of time on our planet. You know, here's 50, 60, 70 years, if you're lucky, enjoy. And during that life, they have the opportunity to develop relationships, to love and care for people. And in so many cases, that experience just ends abruptly. No one gets to say goodbye. Well, some people do, I realize. But say it's a car crash, you know, something like that. Or in this case, someone losing possession of their ability to speak properly or think coherently. You, you don't even get that. You don't even get that. You don't even get to say, peace out, you know, I'm out of here. And that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way a God of love has arranged things. And I know a lot of you who are believers. I, again, I don't disparage those of you who do believe and who need to believe. I think some people do need to believe. But many of you who do believe will be saying, oh, yes, but it's all part of a plan, you know? Jesus came and gave his life, blah, blah, blah. It's all part of a plan. Rubbish plan, though, isn't it? It's pretty... <laughs> It's a pretty bollocks plan if to alleviate mankind's suffering you need to sit back and watch it for millennia to the point where when people die they don't even get to say goodbye properly in many cases and that's if they're lucky enough. I'm talking about situations where people are lucky enough to live into a mature age. Mum was 53, she would have been 73 today still plenty of life left what about people who are deprived of life younger even younger than that, even children so that's you know one of the many many reasons why uh, I, I can't bring myself to conceive of uh, of an intelligent or loving uh, creator anymore but I digress. Uh, it's 20 years today. Mum would have been 73. And it was her passing that 
in a way reinvigorated my um, my beliefs. I was starting to doubt from the age of 19. I was starting to have doubts about my beliefs. But what you're taught as a Jehovah's Witness is, well, they're not really dead. They're not really dead, Lloyd. She's not really dead. She's waiting, or she will be waiting, after Armageddon when she's resurrected into a beautiful paradise earth. She'll be among the first resurrected because her death has occurred closest to Armageddon or, or among those dying close to Armageddon. So she'll get a front row seat in the line for people to be resurrected. You wouldn't want her to be resurrected and you not be there, would you? That would be a tragedy. She's going to be expecting you to be there to greet her when she comes back. And if you want to be there, Lloyd, what you've got to do is be the best Jehovah's Witness you can possibly be. And that's what I did for years, for years, even though I had doubts. I went to ministerial training school and one of the questions on the form that you had to fill in was, do you agree with the publications of The Faithful Slave or words to that effect? And I wrote down, yes, knowing that it was a lie. Because what, a, <laughs> what was I going to do, say no? <laughs> and not only not be allowed into MTS, but also be shunned by my family, be ejected from the organization. So I had to say yes, just had to. But I went to ministerial training school in 2005 as a 25 year old Jehovah's Witness, knowing I had doubts and thinking this, not only is this going to fix my doubts, but also it's going to make mum proud. It's going to make mum proud. This is what she wanted for me. And it was what she wanted for me. She said she wanted me to go to MTS. And she even said, I want you to film your graduation. Not knowing, of course, that you're not allowed to film graduations. So I took along, um, I think it was a JVC camcorder. It used tapes. It wasn't digital. You had to put tapes in it. It was very <laughs> outdated compared to the technology I have now. But anyway, I took along this camcorder and I filmed as much of the MTS as I possibly could. Little conversations in between classes. I think a bit of after the graduation. Little bits and pieces, playing football at the weekend with the other uh, students. And then I, I put it all together uh, at the end with the help of another student um, to commemorate MTS. I called it MTS 29. 29th class of MTS and that was my first video really because it was a lot of work and a lot of editing and it took ages to put together and you'll never ever see it <laughs> um, unedited at least for two reasons first of all I'm a little bit I'm still a little bit um, reticent to show my classmates although that reticence is kind of dissipating somewhat as the years tick by I don't I don't think it's such a huge deal to show them because it's not like I'm exposing them or anything you know they're being shown as believing Jehovah's Witnesses and the second problem with MTS 29 is its length it's really a very a very self-indulgent project really it's not the sort of video I would put out today it, it has everything in it because and the reason why it has everything in it is because I wanted it to have everything in it for mum. I didn't want there to be too many cuts because I wanted mum to be able to see as much as possible of my MTS. And that made it almost unwatchable. <laughs> but I've still got it, I've still got it on DVD and at some point, at some point I might put like an abridged version out. But MTS really was for mum and it was to make mum proud and it's worth 
making very, very clear that mum was a Jehovah's Witness. She was a believing Jehovah's Witness. She died as a believing Jehovah's Witness. How would she feel about my apostasy now? That's a tough one. That's a really tough one. Because... Well, the way I think of it is that there were really two mums. If I'm thinking in, in that context. There's what would Jehovah's Witness mum think of it, i.e. someone without all of the facts, without all of the information, just with their indoctrination. Of course she would be appalled. Of course she would. Appalled by my apostasy. But the real question is, for me at least, how would a mum who is in full possession of the facts, a mum who knows what I know, how would she feel about what I'm doing? And I can only assume that she would be very proud of the work I'm doing if she knew. And there were clues in her final years I say clues, come on, be honest Lloyd. There was one clue, one clue that she had it in her to wake up eventually. And that was um, where we were studying the Daniel book. It was getting towards the end of the Daniel book and it was discussing a verse in Daniel chapter 12, which is the final chapter of Daniel. And I don't know which paragraph it was I'll maybe tell Tibor and I'll put it as a caption. But I was preparing for the study because we were studying the Daniel book for the first time that year. And it was saying something along the lines of this particular verse in Daniel chapter 12, the last chapter of Daniel, Daniel's last prophecy, um, this particular verse is about a Watchtower article. <laughs> That's what Daniel was writing about. The last book of Daniel, a last vision, a last prophecy. He's foretelling a Watchtower article. That's how important the Watchtower is, that Daniel actually foresaw a Watchtower article and decided to include it in his prophecy. And I came up to that part as someone already having doubts and thought, well, this is just so preposterous. I can't not mention this to mum. I can't not mention it to her. And I showed it to her and she was like, yeah, that, that doesn't make sense. You're right. That's fair. How, how, can, that, how can that be a logical interpretation of this particular prophecy it seems very odd that they would say yes this is this was fulfilled by a watchtower article and so credit to mum she went and did what i did not have the courage or bravery to do at that point in my life we had our book study in those days they had book studies midweek ours was on a tuesday in fact all of them in our congregation were on a tuesday and the book study, our book study, was being taken by my dad. My dad was an elder. I was a ministerial servant. And when it came to that paragraph in the study, mum put her hand up. And it was dad, of, again, dad taking it. Uh, yes, dear. <laughs> and mum said, about this paragraph, uh, it seems to be saying that this particular prophecy was fulfilled by a Watchtower article. That can't be right, can it, Jonathan? <laughs> Is that what it's really saying? And and you could see how visibly shaken that was. You're not supposed to do that in a book study, in any kind of meeting of Jehovah's Witnesses. You're not supposed to answer back or or question the person taking the study. You're supposed to give the answer that's given in the paragraph. So she was going against the rules, she was breaking the rules, which again, I didn't have the courage to do at that time. And I, I forget what dad said. He was like, oh, well, you know, 
we have to wait on Jehovah. <laughs> this is this is our understanding at present. Who knows? Um, I forget what he said. It, it clearly wasn't very impressive, or I would probably remember more of it. <laughs> but that was who Mum was, you know. That was who Mum was. That that's the Mum that I have in mind when I ask myself the question: Would she be proud? She didn't like liars. She hated lying. And she hated hypocrisy. She hated people pretending to be something that they weren't. And I would be fascinated to know what she would have made of Stephen Lett and Tony Morris in the JW Broadcasting era. Fascinated. Because they are fools, aren't they? They're clowns. Obviously. And yeah, I don't think she would have liked them. I don't. But we will never know. I can't speak for her. I think it's wrong to speak of, speak on behalf of the dead. Again, she died as a Jehovah's Witness. But at least, hopefully, I've given you some reason why I struggle to think of her as being anything but proud of me and what I'm doing, if it, she at least understood all of the facts and all of the... Um, all of the hypocrisies and scandals and abuse and misery that this organization truly represents, you know. Anyway, I've been prattling on on this paddleboard and I seem to be drifting a little bit closer to shore. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not, I don't know. But in any case, we'll now cut to our apartment. We've got a nice place actually on the other side of that mountain, Biokovo. Our apartment is sort of in that direction and it's facing the mountain from the other side. And I want to carry on talking to you there. So if you're interested, do join me for that. So I'm back at the apartment. This is actually the day after. I've had a bit more time to gather my thoughts and reflect on this 20th anniversary again of my mother's death. It's a very emotional time. Difficult really to put into words exactly what's going on in my head at the moment. But as you can see, where we're staying is absolutely magnificent. We've got the Biokovo mountain behind us. We're actually high up in a valley. There's a river below us. You can hear the sound of birds. You can hear the sound of water in the distance. There are even eagles circling now and then. It turns out there are eagles in this part of Croatia. And yeah, just a really restful place to remember mum. 
this is actually exactly the sort of place she would have really enjoyed. She really loved the outdoors. She loved hiking. She loved going to the Lake District and spending time hiking around there. She loved walking her dog. I guess being in nature would have brought her a lot of tranquility. She also liked travelling, although she didn't manage to do much travelling in her later years. Pretty much after starting a family, I don't think finances really allowed her to travel abroad. She did travel a lot when she was younger. She spent a year in Greece. I know she travelled to America once. I think she definitely had an adventurous spirit, but there was also a lot of sadness in her life. There was a lot of adversity that required a lot of strength from her. She didn't have the most privileged of upbringings. I wouldn't say she was poor when she was a child, but she certainly didn't have a wealthy upbringing either. She grew up in quite a poor neighbourhood in Manchester. She had two marriages before she met my dad, one of which ended tragically in her second husband dying in a fire. So she actually went through a lot of adversity in her life and that will have required a great deal of strength. I think my mother was a very, very strong woman. I hope that I can replicate to at least some degree her strength and resilience because, yeah, she went through so much. I think it was actually losing her second husband in such tragic circumstances and subsequently being love-bombed by Jehovah's Witnesses that got her into the religion because she'd had some contact with Jehovah's Witnesses earlier in life and then when they basically love-bombed her following her second husband's death and this would have been as well the build-up to 1975 that was what got her in. That was what, I guess, gave her comfort from all of the difficulties that she'd been experiencing. And then she ended up, of course, meeting my dad and having two children, myself and my sister. But she was a very, very strong woman. And if I can replicate just a fraction of her strength, I'll be so happy. She fought through so much including obviously the illness that got her in the end. I'll never forget having a conversation with her about what it means to fight cancer because it seemed like such an odd thing for people to say, oh, you should fight it, you should fight cancer. I didn't know much about cancer when mum was diagnosed, but it seemed like something that you couldn't really fight. It either killed you or it didn't. So I asked mum, you know, what does it mean, Mum, to fight cancer? How can you possibly fight it? And she looked at me and she said, well, let me tell you all of the ways I've fought cancer. I've taken all these different medications. I've taken all these treatments, chemotherapy. I've changed my diet. I've taken up exercise regimes. She even tried homeopathy. She tried absolutely anything she could anything that gave her even the smallest likelihood of increasing her odds. And obviously it still took her in the end, but she said, if anyone tells me that I've not fought cancer, I'll punch them. I forget exactly what she said, but she made it very clear that she had fought it and she did fight it. She was a fighter. She was an incredibly strong woman. And as I said, Yesterday, she also didn't suffer fools. She hated liars. She hated hypocrites. And even if my life hasn't gone as she'd planned, I like to think that my activism, in a way, is her legacy. Because I can't stand liars and I can't stand hypocrites. And I get that aversion to lying in hypocrisy in many ways from her. You know, these are, apologies for the wind, these are principles that she imbued in me as my mother. 
and so yeah if I can replicate at least some of her strength and continue to hold liars and hypocrites accountable in some way that's probably the best way of remembering mum and also raising her beautiful grandchildren in a loving environment where they have everything they need which is how she raised me if I can be half the parent to them that she was to me I'll have done my job I'll be so happy so yeah lots going on in my head at the moment viewers and it's been quite a struggle to spit it out in fact this is maybe my second or third attempt at filming just this final part of the video um, lots to, to say lots that I could say but this is probably what needs to be said I miss mum I could have done with having her around I think the last 20 years of my life would have gone so much better if she'd been around again I can't say to what extent she would have been in my life given the whole issue with religion and her indoctrination we'll never know how that would have played out but I like to think even despite those complications even despite issues with religion she would have enhanced my life if she'd been around if she hadn't died and she would have been a much bigger presence a much bigger presence in my life than my dad has been but that's about it I guess so much I could say but the main thing is to remember mum for the incredibly strong loving caring person that she was and I'm doing that as best I can in this video and in my activism work but that's all I have to say really viewers thank you for indulging me with this video don't forget that you can enjoy more videos by subscribing to the Lloyd Evans channel but for now thank you so much for watching Thank you.